good. Thank you. Well, dear all, welcome at the Institute for Advanced Study of the University of Amsterdam. Uh, my name is Huub Dijsselbloem. I'm the scientific director of the EOS, and it's a pleasure to meet you at our second Science Beyond the Horizon lecture. Today, we are incredibly honored to have Professor Cartwright as our guest. Um, the mission of the EAS is to advance cutting-edge research that addresses complex scientific and societal challenges. But the core of our institute is the development of methodologies to foster interdisciplinary research. And for that reason, it's an enormous pleasure to welcome you here, Professor Cartwright. Thank you. Uh, Nancy Cartwright is a world-renowned expert on the philosophy of the natural sciences, especially physics and of the philosophy and methodology of the social sciences. Her current research focuses on objectivity and evidence, especially for evidence-based policy. She's professor of philosophy at Durham University and a distinguished professor at the University of California, San Diego, and was affiliated to Stanford University and to the London School of Economics. Her lecture will be followed by a panel discussion and a general Q and A. And the organizer of this Science Beyond the Horizon event is uh, Federica Russa. Um, she will introduce Professor Cartwright and the panelists in more detail later on. Federica Russo herself is a philosopher of science and technology uh, based at the University of Amsterdam, a member of the EAS management team. Her research concerns philosophy of technology and philosophy of science and practice. She focuses in particular on issues of causality evidence-based medicine and mixed methods. Um, at the EAS, she has organized the Inspiring Causality Series and the Mixed Methods and Mixed Data Research Series. Just that you know that at the EAS, we work at the forefront of the philosophy and practice uh, of science as well. Um, Federica, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Hub, and a uh, huge thanks to Nancy for having accepted our invitation. Before I give a short introduction to, to Nancy, let me give you a couple of housekeeping announcements. So Hub already uh, reminded you what the format of uh, our event is today. First, we will have a presentation from Nancy, then we will have a um, discussion with our uh, panelists, and then we will uh, welcome uh, questions uh, from uh, the audience. We ask you to, uh, uh, mm, to ask your questions in the Q&A chat and we will not monitor the normal chat for questions. So if you want to use the chat to talk among yourselves, so please go ahead, but we will not monitor uh, that uh, for the Q&A part. So having said that, I am really, really honored to chair this meeting today and uh, um, so let me just tell you why I am so honored, not just because everyone should feel honored to have uh, the opportunity to interact with uh, a scholar like uh, Nancy Cartwright, but this is really, uh, this, meeting, this meeting has a special, special meaning uh, to me because uh, Nancy has been and still is uh, a great uh, role model for many of us uh, in, in, in the profession. She uh, has always been a step ahead in leading the research uh, agenda in uh, philosophy of science. Uh, she has been a role model for uh, the quality of her research and the depth, uh, the breadth of her ideas, and uh, especially for uh, speaking to non-philosophers and so making philosophy really useful and relevant outside our ivory towers. And also for giving a powerful uh, voice to, to women uh, in academia. So Nancy Cartwright uh, uh, is one of those scholars that uh, uh, does not deserve an introduction because she is very well known and uh, um, I don't think I would like to spend uh, time in recalling so many awards, prizes, projects, books she published, so the numerous achievements, but I, uh, this is information that you can find on the, on the internet and uh, Huber has already given you the, the basics. Instead, I would like to tell you who uh, is Nancy uh, Cartwright for a scholar uh, like me. And I've been in the profession for uh, quite some time, uh, some solid uh, 15 and more years, and Nancy has always been uh, there, big and visible when I started already as a grad as an undergraduate student, and she still is. When I was a young undergraduate and graduate student, it was her work in philosophy of physics, laws, and models that was a must uh, read. Um, and uh, 
in the beginning when I was uh, uh, studying in Italy, she, she was already prominent also so outside the English speaking world and also when I was uh, uh, in Belgium. And then she has been highly influential in thinking and rethinking about causality. And these were the years when the, the Center for Philosophy of the Natural and Social Sciences at the London School of Economics was the temple of causality. Uh, she was a pioneer in engaging with the formal models like Bayesian Nets with very uh, um, fantastic debates uh, also with people like Judea Pearl. She has been looking critically at statistics-based practices such as in econometrics. She has put forward positive metaphysical views uh, of causality in terms of causes as powers. All of this and much more has kept us philosophers of science and of causality very busy for a long time. And that's not all, there is actually much more. The moment in which uh, evidence-based medicine was not yet the kind of religion that it is now, Nancy was or had already understood that philosophers had to engage with it. And she um, managed to, to, to express uh, important arguments about the meaning and use of RCTs, randomized control trials, and then uh, to make the discourse even broader about policy and evidence-based policy. So she pioneered the idea that we have to use causal knowledge, not just to reflect on what causality means um, metaphysically. And the work, uh, so making the work of philosophers was really important and going outside the walls of philosophy uh, departments. So thank you so much, Nancy, uh, because you have been such an active scholar in philosophy of science and in these fields of modeling, causality, and policy, but also for creating intellectual space for me and for many others to develop our ideas, especially when these ideas were outside the rigid tracks of mainstream philosophy of science. And also thank you for keeping engaging with the community, even if you have plenty of outstanding scholars in, in the Olymp of philosophy and outside philosophy to talk to, you still keep talking to us. Uh, and let me give you a couple of examples of, of what I mean. So in, in the late, um, in, 2000, so Nancy was at the uh, CPNSS, and uh, as I said, that was the temple of causality. And around that time, when I was at the University of Kent, with some other colleagues, we started the uh, Causality in the Sciences conference series. This started actually quite small, but Nancy came to our meetings rather frequently, and it, it, she really made it a vibrant community. And causality is still a, a hot topic, and Nancy still goes to uh, uh, even smaller scale case workshop in causality. The latest one I was in uh, last uh, uh, summer, so Nancy also gave uh, uh, a very interesting presentation with junior scholar and giving plenty of useful feedback to any uh, of us. So, uh, so much for uh, all the very good reasons uh, to, have, uh, to have you with us, uh, uh, Nancy. Uh, today, uh, Nancy will give a presentation for about 40-45 minutes. This will be followed by questions from some panelists. So let me give you a very brief introduction to uh, who they are. We have uh, Sonia Smets, Professor of Logic and Epistemology at the Institute for Logic, Language and Computation at the University of Amsterdam. Chris Dix, Professor of Data Analysis and Economic Statistics also at the University of Amsterdam and also associate at the ES. Uh, John Green, He's a physicist by training, but now professor in political science and specialized in the design and the governance of system innovations. Uh, Marcia Schermer, professor of medicine and bioethics at Erasmus University Rotterdam, and Hank de Recht, professor of philosophy of natural sciences at the Institute of Science in Society at the Radboud University in Nijmegen. And um, after the discussion with the panel, we will open the floor uh, from the public. As I said, I kindly ask you to use the Q&A function uh, in Zoom to pose your question and make a considerate use of, of the chat. Uh, so, one final note, uh, being in charge of uh, the preparation of the meeting, I had the privilege to see some of the material in advance. And when I contacted Nancy, uh, Nancy said, well, I'm not sure I have the right uh, speaker for you because you want uh, to science to go beyond uh, the horizon. And uh, now her, uh, the title of her talk is uh, In the Earthly 
plain. And uh, I had no uh, doubt that Nancy would have uh, like a powerful message for us. And so, Nancy, the floor is yours. Thanks again for being with us. It's, it's really a, a, a treat to be with you and with so many people whose work I admire. Uh, just last week, uh, Frederica, I was, um, I was quizzing a South African PhD um, who had written on the Rousseau-Williamson thesis <laughs> and uh, I was defending you. <laughs> uh, and he was pretty good at uh, anyway, it was a lo lovely occasion, and so I was thinking of you really, you know, in quite detail, seriously, uh, last week, and it's nice to see all the rest of you, and it's an honor to be here. Um, thank you very much. Um, I guess I should share screen and uh, start. Aha, it doesn't want to do it. So let's, uh, okay. How's that? Is that okay? It is perfect. Okay. So, um, the uh, talk is titled, um, as Federica said, Science in the Earthly Plane. And it's a um, built on uh, some ideas uh, that we've been developing. I and four co authors have been developing in a book for Oxford Press called The Tangle of Science. Okay. <clears throat> um, the series, uh, and this is the story that Frederick has already uh, told you, the series is called Science Beyond the Horizons, and I thought, really, I, this is wrong series to ask me to talk in, uh, because I really am taken up uh, lately with science well below the horizons and what I call science in the earthly plane. And I get that expression from my hero Otto Neurath, uh, who urged that we do philosophy in the earthly plane. Okay. <clears throat> now, um, I begin with what I found um, what to be the, uh, some of the dominant images of science. Uh, that I think are mistaken. So I think that the really dominant popular image that I think also a lot of scientists, particularly the ones you know who are on the end, <laughs> who get praised for this, um, they think of uh, science as grand theory and wonderful breakthrough experiments that are done by men of genius. Okay. Now, um, that's just wrong, right? Science does not equal anything like theory plus experiment. Um, it consists of lots and lots and lots and lots more. And we all know that, but I think uh, we don't properly attend to it. And especially philosophers of science don't properly attend to it. So that's part of what we want to do in this book is to, um, and today I want to do is to kind of nudge us <laughs> to care about all this other lots more and recognize that theory and experiment are just one tiny bit and they can't play their role. Um, I mean, they only play one tiny role and they can't play it without all the rest of this thing we call the tangle. And you'll come to see eventually why we call it that. Um, so what I urge is a more intellectually humble image of uh, science, one that gives due attention to and due credit to all the products of science that it takes to ensure the reliability of any one of them. So I'm interested in all of the products of science. I think that we want them all to be reliable. And in order for any one of them to be reliable, we <laughs> have to ensure the reliability of a whole bunch of others. So it's a big, you can see a big tangle of connections. Okay. Uh, and I can't actually see what's on the bottom of my screen. I wonder how to get rid of you, how to get rid of this. Ah, there, good, okay. So um, this is science in the earthly plane. Okay. Now, um, when I talk about all these many, many products of science, um, here are some I care about. Models, methods, practices, concept development, concept validation, measures, evaluations, devices, statistical analyses, data curation, pr data cu to production, data preservation, data classification, data dissemination, narratives, and lots, lots more. So when I talk, I mean, I mean all of these uh, to be products uh, of science. <clears throat> so I, I claim that all of these together 
make for any one scientific success. Well, we don't need all of all of them uh, for every uh, for every success, but we need many, many, many uh, uh, from uh, from this the, this list uh, for any one scientific success. Um, now, note that I've talked about uh, all the products of science it takes to ensure the reliability of any one of them. So one of the things I'm going to go on now and talk about is reliability and why I talk about reliability. And the other um, is, you see, I'm talking about products, and I don't think it's so common to talk about products of science. I'm going to explain to you why I do that. Now, uh, I am, like uh, many of you, uh, keen on uh, the philosophy of science uh, in practice. Um, and th that it was a very important movement to focus on the practices of science, you know, what science is actually doing. Um, but for today, I want to, um, I'm happy to um, <laughs> take on board, we should pay attention to what science actually does, what, what its practices are. But I want to direct attention today uh, to the products, the things it produces. <clears throat> so what to expect? Um, the first uh, question that I want to address is why do I talk about reliability? And the answer I'm going to give is, well, I talk about reliability so that we can ensure we get done what we want to get done, get done what we're aiming for. Um, what secures reliability? Uh, answer, <laughs> this thing we call the tangle. <laughs> and why do I talk about products? Well, the answer is because of the need for quality assurance. And I think that quality assurance is a concept that's closely connected with products. Okay, so let's start with reliability. <clears throat> um, philosophy has uh, tended to focus, not just tended to, I mean, it's almost entirely focused on theory and its truth or confirmation. But my advice is to refocus um, on all the products of science and in particular on their reliability. So we're going to get away from theory and look at all products of science, and we're not going to worry so much about truth and confirmation, but instead focus on reliability. Now there are, uh, today I'll just raise three good reasons to focus on reliability. Um, the one is that the bulk of what we need to do, what we, <coughs> that we, that the bulk of the things that we need to do, what we expect of them, those things the bulk of those things are not truth out, but we want them to do what we expect of them. So um, that's sort of the, co the concept of reliability is, is serving. Uh, and if you just, if you get start off on the, the road of just thinking about um, truth uh, and confirmation, um, you just tend to not even notice uh, these other products and they're not truth out to begin with. <clears throat> Second argument is, <clears throat> I don't think you can have either truth or confirmation without reliability of far more. So, um, okay, and the third argument I'll rehearse is reliability immediately invites the crucial question, reliability to do what? For what purpose? And I think that's a question that we often uh, don't pay nearly enough attention to. Okay, reliability reason one. Um, I said that uh, lots of the things that we want, lots of the <laughs> products that we want to perform the way we expect them to, uh, they're not truth out to begin with. So claims and, uh, and theories might be truth out, but um, hardly anything in this list uh, that I've, in fact, nothing I think in this list uh, of other products of science besides theories, claims, laws um, are truth out. So that's reason number one is, uh, you, you ought to be worrying about the reliability of these products, that they do what we need them to do, um, and they're not truth out. So if you just get stuck fo focusing on truth, um, you're not answering the questions that need to be answered about these guys. Okay, now, the second reason is that um, imagine that for the moment, you know, we can all do different things, and you want uh, to understand truth and warrant. And what you want is truth, and uh, you want confirmed truth, you want warrant. Well, still, my claim uh, is that you can't have either truth or confirmation without all the rest of this stuff. So uh, 
it's a bit like this. You can start, uh, you can start with truth or confirmation, but you're going to end up uh, having uh, to call on the tangle anyway. So the, uh, let me rehearse one of the reasons for this. Let's just start. I'm going to look at one root that takes you from uh, truth uh, to the tangle. But really what I'm gonna do is, um, it's not just truth to the tangle. Um, we really want uh, warrant uh, that something is true. Um, in fact, I'm gonna back up and I'll say, uh, before we even get to asking for warrant that it's true, um, we, all, we ought to have warrant that, that, that it's truth apt, that, that the, the sentences you're using are actually talking sense, that they express a truth apt claim, a claim that could be true or false. That's even before you get to evaluating whether it is true or false. So just even if you start um, wanting to know what assurances you could have that you're actually talking empirical sense, you're to, uh, that, you're, that, you're, um, uh, that you're making a truth apt claim, um, my claim is that you're gonna need uh, to uh, call on a whole lot of other stuff. And I'm gonna just look at one route to um, starting uh, with, you know, that you'd like, you'd like some warrant that you're making a truth out to claim and how this just um, catapults you into uh, a lot of the, a need for a lot of other things. So it can't have a truth out to claim without having concepts in it. They employ concepts and the concepts ought to be ones that get a grip on the world. They have an empirical grip. Um, I'm not even gonna talk about them having a uh, meaning um, that also takes you down another route. Uh, but, well, let's just think, do, do they have an empirical grip? Um, and um, so you first you need the concepts and then in order to assure that the concepts actually have an empirical grip, um, we have some validation procedures. Okay, that's to validate that they do have uh, an empirical grip, a uh, grip on the world. Um, again, off to the side, you need to have some validation. Validation procedures actually do assure you that concepts get a grip on the world. Now, the validation procedures themselves, um, one major way of uh, validating the concepts, uh, that the concepts are actually picking out something or other in the world is that you get consistent results from different measures. There's other ways too. I mean, for instance, you want um, the, uh, uh, the concepts um, that actually play, uh, that get a grip on the world to um, have uh, fit, fit into uh, other theoretical contexts and claims than the, than the one you're trying to find out whether it's truth out or not. But, and, and then there's many others, but let's just go down this route of the validation procedures that require um, that you're looking for consistent results from different measures. And so you need, you need measures <laughs> um, and a measure for like a measure for poverty or a measure for electric charge. Um, uh, a measure has, uh, you don't have a measure unless you've got some um, three, at least three components for it. You have to have a characterization of the concept that you're measuring. You have to have a formal representation of it. I mean, are you, uh, are you using an ordinal scale, a cardinal scale? Um, are you, uh, okay, that kind of thing. And you need some actual physical procedures to carry out uh, to assign values to the systems that you're measuring for the concept that you're, uh, the, that you're supposed to be measuring. Um, now, if you go back to characterization, um, you need uh, some defense that the more precise characterization you've given is uh, appropriate to and really is a precipitation of the concept that you need up there at the start uh, in the truth out claim. Uh, and that's not always easy to do. Uh, if you think about, for instance, um, um, measures of poverty, uh, and then you have to characterize, or well-being, and you characterize them very precisely, then you have to worry, was that um, the, the very kind of, um, the very sense of poverty that we had in our original claim. So you need a defense that the characterization is, um, uh, is appropriate. Then um, the representation has to be appropriate to that concept. Um, and that depends a lot on what the stuff in the world is, how it's responding. Uh, and we know that um, we have some 
often have this done by formal representation theorems, but even when you don't have formal representation theorems, you really don't have um, a good measure if you don't have an, um, uh, any often an, an argument that the, the formal way to representing it is really appropriate to the concept. Then let's look at the procedures. How do you know that those procedures are procedures that measure the concept that, <laughs> that you characterized? Um, for that, you, you usually have measurement models and so forth and so forth and so forth. Okay, so that's all just to say that um, if you want actually to have any warrant that you really are talking sense and making a truth act claim, um, you're immediately going to end up with this need for this huge tangle of other work that's all done properly and um, and can do do the job it's supposed to. That the validation procedures in this case, that are used in this case, are good for validating that concept, <laughs> that that concept that's in your truth that claim has, uh, it does get a grip on the world, etc. cetera. Okay. So uh, here's a social science example of uh, measure of validation procedures um, um, that I've looked at recently. Uh, for instance, defending that the post-conviction risk assessment algorithm which I think is morally rather dicey, but at any rate, it's a, it, it's a very commonly used uh, uh, algorithm in the United States um, for uh, deciding whether people should be let out on, uh, 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 of jail uh, when they're be right, you know, right before their uh, term is really up. Um, is, and the, to defend that that, that, that measure, <laughs> Uh, the, that measurement procedure, the post-conviction risk assessment algorithm, um, is reliable to predict recidivism accurately and without racial uh, and uh, in a racially unbiased way. Okay. So that's what we want it to do. So, um, and in order to assess that, uh, in order to, uh, to defend that, it, it is uh, reliable for that job. Um, uh, you address a great variety of issues and uh, so one of the issues that it's conventional and they do in this case, uh, I'm quoting from a paper uh, defending the PCRA, officers must complete a training and certification process to administer the PCRA. The certification process has been shown to yield high rates of inter-rater agreement in scoring. I use this kind of social science example because I think uh, we often uh, kind of forget how much attention to uh, validity we have in the social sciences. Um, then there are worries about test bias. These are just some of the worries among others. Uh, there's little evidence of test bias. The instrument strongly predicts arrest for both black and white offenders, and a given score has essentially the same meaning, okay, the same probability of recidivism across groups. So those are uh, the a uh, kind of validation procedures we use to validate that this concept, um, and, and, and in this case, it's uh, the PCR algorithm that this measure, sorry, that this measure can uh, do uh, what it's supposed to. Okay. Um, interlude. Well, why I'm going on an interlude here is um, I think it's now uh, having had a couple of uh, the. the examples um, I can explain why we why in the in our book we talk about a tangle okay uh, of course there's lots of defense of an explication of what we try to what we and try to intend by that but um, the reason I talk use the word tangle is because these different products that are needed uh, to secure the reliability of any one product. So we want to secure the reliability of the PCRA uh, to do uh, accurate and unbiased uh, recidivism predictions, um, racially unbiased. Um, we, so that's a product. And the background set of products that are necessary um, that have to do their job properly in order to, um, for, us to be warranted that the, that the PCRA is reliable. Okay. Those different products, they don't just pile up. It's not like there's just one of them with their heap. Um, uh, they have to fit together in the right way, which is what we were seeing in that chart uh, where we started with truth aptness. Um, 
And moreover, to warrant uh, reliability, this tree of support, and this, in our case, it was a tree of support for truth aptness, it's going to interweave with others. And so um, that's why we talk about the, um, this kind of network of other things that you need for the reliability of any one product um, being uh, a tangle. And uh, our main theses are that science consists of a vast collection of products, and we want each to do what we expect of it. Uh, and then we question, well, what makes any one of them reliable to do what we expect of it? A vast tangle of other scientific products that are themselves reliable to do what is expected of them. Hence the title of the book, which is the tangle of science, reliability beyond um, rigor, method, rigor, and objectivity. Okay, and here's, the, uh, here's how we picture science. Uh, that's uh, uh, an African chicana bird, uh, which builds its nest on water. So I, mean, I think of uh, like uh, the, the Neurod image of that, uh, we're sailors uh, uh, rebuilding our ships at sea, never able to put into dry dock uh, to build from scratch on solid ground. Um, so I think that's what science is doing, like the chicana bird. and. Um, here's how science props up its reliable creations by this tangle of a ton of other, uh, a, a ton of mixed uh, ingredients, and they're tangled together and interwoven in the right way to actually provide support for something which is floating on water. Um, okay, so that's the story about the tangle, short story about the tangle. Now let's return to reliability. Uh, <clears throat> I said there were three reasons uh, that I uh, will talk about today for focusing on reliability, refocusing from truth to reliability. And uh, this is the, the, the last one, um, and, and that's that reliability invites the right question. Uh, philosophers talk about products of science, I and mean, usually we're talking about theories, um, but we talk about products of science being accepted. Sometimes we talk about models being accepted, okay. uh, but we tend to use the word accepted or acceptable. Science studies uh, discourse tends to talk about them being stabilized. Okay. Um, but no product is good to court. And no, nothing is, should just be accepted or stabilized, that there it is. Um, um, they, all these, including theories, are good for doing some job and doing that job for some purpose. Or maybe they're good for doing many jobs, but they're doing good for doing specific jobs for specific kinds of purposes. Um, and the purposes are important because they help flesh out the job to be done. No matter how much detail you put into the job to be done, um, there's always a way to do that job, which is actually not a good way to do it for the purpose that that was uh, intended. So the purposes help flesh out the always underdetermined uh, job to be done. So let's do a familiar example of models. Um, the kind of question is, is a model accepted, acceptable? Well, you know, we know that <laughs> we really want to know what, what, what job this particular model is supposed to be doing. Is it intended to provide understanding? And if, if so, to whom? Uh, is it intended to provide accurate predictions? And if so, what are the stakes? How accurate do they have to be? And how, uh, how probable do, the, do they have to be accurate? How probable is it that they have to be that accurate? Um, predictions about what? Uh, models make some correct, some models very reliably make some correct predictions about some kind of things and not about others. Um, should it depict significant causes of a target result? Or maybe if we're in the realm of thinking about causation, it's meant to isolate a single cause to study its peculiar effect. Um, are we going to probe the model to learn about the world? That's uh, something Mary Morgan's talked a lot about. You know, just how do we plan to prove it, probe it, uh, and what do we expect to learn, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. Um, now, what I like to point out is that laws and principles are not exempt from this. Even our best general principles do a good job in some uses, but not others. We learn how and where to use them. I mean, I th somehow I think there's a, there's a thought that, um, that there's just this principle and it has these 
terms in it and the terms just latch right immediately onto the world and the, you know you don't have to worry about much else and then it's either true or false um, and um, you can um, just use it any old way if it's true or if it's warranted to be true and that just is just not the case at all um, even our best general principles do a good job in some uses and not others and um, what's you know, what's good, what's good about the, the science that we do is we are very often, very often learn how and where to use them. Okay. And of course, sometimes um, the, the practices we've evolved and the understanding that we have is uh, limited. So we sometimes make mistakes about how and where we can use them. Um, but at any rate, the point is that it's, I think, thinking in terms of true versus not true for our theories or law claims is the wrong thing to evaluate. Um, I think like all other products, uh, we should be careful, uh, a good principle or be reliable to do X for purposes Y, um, and we shouldn't lose sight of that. Um, okay. Now, example, uh, this is not an example of principles, it's just back to the, uh, the case about needing to think about purposes uh, as well as the job that, uh, it, that's to be done. Uh, this is uh, taken from Julian Rice. Um, uh, sorry, is the, um, is the CPI, the Consumer Price Index, a reliable measure of inflation? So that starts out with, we've got a measure and what it's supposed to be doing is measuring inflation. So that's the job to be done. Well, that job is too vaguely specified uh, when it comes to really deciding how to answer this question. Um, so you might say something more, a little bit more precise like this. Uh, the US say 2020 consumer price index is to measure the average change in prices over time that US consumers pay for a basket of, good, a basket of goods and services in 20, did I say 2020? Anyway, what, what, whatever year. That's, um, that's, a, 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 a more precise specification of the job that's supposed to be done. But still, um, Julian asks, you still have to think about for what purposes if you want to know whether it's reliable. So um, as, the, as the, the procedures that are actually um, laid down for calculating the CPI, as they stand, um, it, maybe, uh, maybe they are reliable for measuring <laughs> uh, the average change in prices over time the US consumers pay for a basket of goods and services um, in order to guide the government in setting interest rates. But Julian argues they're not very good for ensuring that the benefits for the elderly, veterans, the carless poor secure the same standard of living from year to year. So you know that, um, in, um, that very often, benefits are pegged to uh, the measure of inflation to try and guarantee that the be benefits recipients are still able to have the same standard of living uh, from one year to the next with their benefits. Um, now, uh, if you look at the way that the CPI is calculated, uh, they um, have a reasonable weight for the prices that are paid for goods in suburban retail outlets that are where things are cheaper than they are in the middle of town in the high street. Um, and that's fine if what you want is uh, to figure out uh, the average so that you can set interest rates, but it's certainly not going to ensure that the elderly veterans and anybody without a car um, is able to, to have, have the same standard of living um, because they can't get to these uh, outlets. Okay. So that, that's an example of, from Julian of um, why we need to look to the, the, why we need to look further to the um, purposes in order to really see uh, judge reliability. Now, uh, another case that Eleanor Montuski uh, who's one of the co-authors of the book, um, has talked about is the Valent Dam disaster in 1963. So there was the Valent Dam at the beginning of 1963, thereafter. And that's Langroni, the village down the uh, downstream. So I'll tell you what happened. Um, 
1963, there was a huge landslide uh, in the rocks behind uh, the reservoir of the Valent Dam, a limestone uh, landslide. It moved 250 meter thick, massive rock, three to 400 meters horizontally. Uh, 270 million cubic meters of rock fell into the reservoir um, and it was moving at 25 meters per second when it happened. Uh, now, the interesting thing uh, is that the dam withstood and it stood up. Um, it was sort of forced roughly eight times what it was designed for. So um, the dam was, <laughs> the, the models for designing the dam were reliable for building a dam that was going to stand withstand uh, a, a, a horrific force uh, exerted on it. Okay. But what happened then was that because the dam withstood the force, roughly the entire reservoir blew over the dam, sending a 70 meter wall of water down the Veyon Gorge. Uh, destroying Langaroni and several uh, and severely damaging other villages uh, down the valley. Okay. Uh, two, at least 2,043 people were killed. So now, um, what uh, uh, Pierre Le, Le Brata and Leonora uh, have argued, and I've kind of um, gussied it up a bit, <laughs> is uh, the engineers um, had focused on two purposes. Um, you know, they wanted uh, models that were reliable, that were reliable uh, to ensure that the planned dam would stand against a range of onslaughts. As I said, it you know, really did stand against a very much um, stronger than they even had uh, intended, uh, built it for. And um, also they wanted um, plans that um, would take into account whether the surrounding stone would actually support the dam. So it could be that the dam stood, but the stone around it cracked. Okay. Um, now, the, on the whole, their models were reliable for these purposes. Okay. Um, but of course, I mean, there's another purpose that's obviously an implicit, uh, such an obvious one, is that, um, is that, the lives which should, uh, of the, in the region should be safe in the face of those onslaughts. And actually what it looks like they was a, the engineers assumed was that if they had a yes answer to the first two questions, that their models were reliable for that, um, that that would imply that the lives were safe. Um, and um, the problem is that the models were not reliable uh, for this purpose. And it was, you know, an, ob an obvious and important uh, purpose. Um, and in fact, the issue wasn't properly considered. Um, so, um, what what um, the main thing that was missing uh, was the modeling of landslides. Uh, <clears throat> so, I'm now quoting from a. Uh, uh, a post-hoc analysis of it. Prediction of multi-hazard slope stability events requires an informed and judicious choice of the possible scenarios. An incorrect definition of landslide conditions can lead to inaccurate predictions, wrong engineering and risk management decisions, which is just what was made there. Um, now, um, so what happened in this case was there were reduced scale experiments uh, to, that were carried out two years before the Bayon disaster. Uh, so there was some modeling of landslides, uh, right? uh, but they were carried out with a material that was not representative of the actual rock slide behavior and did not consider the simultaneous failure of the whole landslide body. Uh, based on these inappropriate assumptions, the physical models led to wrong estimates of the safety of the safety operational level for the Bayon reservoir. Um, so now that's um, that's what was missing that would have made the helped ensure the reliability of the models for the dam uh, to preserve uh, lives down the valley. Uh, now the other thing uh, that was missing is that the engineers also relied on a usually reliable but not in this case generic. So the chief engineer tells us the rocks of the Veneto region, you know, which is where the dam was built, are generally very good. Overall, limestone is honest because it reveals its flaws on its surface. So they um, 
relied on this generic rather than doing detailed studies of those local rocks um, in order to, um, they assumed then that the limestone uh, would be stable and um, it wasn't actually flawed. It was flawed and uh, that's why there was a landslide. Uh, now we may usually take this generic to be reliable for predicting limestone failure, okay? um, but not when the purpose is to build a dam where thousands of lives might be at risk. So I mean, this is the course sort of standard problem with generics. Um, the generic is reliable. That's you know it doesn't nothing is too can you say too court like that. You have to say it's reliable for certain purposes. Uh, certain, to do certain jobs like predicting limestone failure and um, then it, you actually do have to have some thought to what the purposes of making that prediction are in the case at hand to see whether or not you've done enough to assure reliability. Okay, so that's all I was going to say about um, reliability. Uh, let's turn to products. Uh, I don't have too much to say about them, but the, um, the reason that I want to stress products rather than practices, for instance, is that um, products are something that we put products on shelves for others to take down to use. So somebody builds the product, tests the product, labels the product, puts it on the shelf, and somebody else is supposed to be able to come along and take it down and use it. Um, um, okay. Um, so we put products on shelves for others to take down to use with labels for what they are and what they are good for. And that's uh, what I think we're doing uh, in science um, when we have in the background um, this vast array of accumulated collect accumulation of products um, that we put on the shelves like measures and concepts um, and validation procedures. Um, you, know, there's, you learn validation procedures. You, you, you pick up a measure that somebody else has developed. Um, so you put the, those, are, those have been put on the shelf, they've been uh, certified as reliable, but notice <laughs> they're reliable, they, they can't have been certified just as being reliable or just being true, they have to be certified for being reliable for certain purposes, um, for, to do certain jobs and for certain purposes. So I claim that science works by accumulating a vast store of products available for use and reuse um, that are validated as reliable for certain jobs, for certain purposes, albeit, as I said often, uh, the purposes uh, and jobs are implicit. Um, and often, you know, <laughs> we've, well, the, the kind of vast, the understanding we have about what they are reliable for, uh, what jobs they can do and for what purposes, Oh, sometimes it's mistaken, but nevertheless, we have done a, you know, we try to do a good job to, to validate um, these products of science as reliable for certain jobs for certain purposes. And I don't see how science could work otherwise. I mean, this is st stuff we all know. It's just that it seems to me as philosophers, we don't pay enough attention to it and it doesn't direct the attention of our research in the right direction. So, uh, <clears throat> What I think we need to do far more is uh, pay attention to quality assurance and labeling. So we're gonna, you know, we, we study putting things on the science accredited shelves. Mostly we only study putting uh, uh, theories and, um, and laws there, but you know, we do study that and what allows us to, as it were, put it on the shelves and say accredited or accepted or acceptable. Okay. Um, so this is a, a picture of putting a measure. <laughs> this is a, a really simple measure. It's just a foot rule, but we're putting that uh, on the shelf as a reliable way uh, to uh, uh, measure small objects that are not too small, not too big, uh, and don't have to be measured too accurately um, when you want to know their length. Okay, so my con concluding remarks, very short, um, there are two directions. Okay, so this is just to urge us to look in both directions. Um, you know, there's putting products on the science accredited shelves, and we have to learn um, how to do that and you know, how 
this business of labeling, validating, uh, specifying either implicitly or explicitly the purposes, how that all works. Uh, and um, But there's also uh, the, the matching um, activity that happens in science all the time is that scientists go and take products down from the shelves to use in their current uh, in their current projects and we have very little attention in philosophy to um how they often get it right but you know how does that work right um we don't uh, we don't understand i think standards of quality assurance uh, for that okay so um Philosophy uh, has tended to um, tends to focus on a very few products, like principles and theories. Then we did move on to experiments, uh, maybe even thirty years ago. Then later we did some we did attend a bit to models, went quite a bit to models, and now recently there's been uh, some attention to measures. So you know, we are expanding our horizons on the kind of uh, things we attend to. Um, uh, but then when we attend to them, we attend primarily to quality assurance for putting them on the shelves okay, and scant attention to taking them off. And if you don't pay attention to taking them off and you know, putting them to use and um, warranting that they are being used in the right way and they can do the job that they need to in this uh, to make the new product reliable. If we don't pay attention to that, um, then we, we're really ignoring what jobs they're reliable for and for what purposes. And that means we overlook a lot that's needed for putting these products on the shelves in the first place. So it's it's not, it's not just that there's a whole half of the process that we're ignoring and not paying any attention to the how um, and what warrants taking something off the shelf and using it in this context. Um, but because we're ignoring that, um, we don't see a lot of the, we don't talk about a lot of the issues we need to talk about uh, um, in, uh, about putting things on the shelves in the first place, we do tend to ignore this attention to what, you know, that we really want reliability, we need to know then what jobs they're reliable for and for what purposes. So, um, the, um, to co conclude by saying that I think to understand the success of science, we need to look not beyond the horizons or not just beyond the horizons, uh, and not primarily to grand theory and breakthrough experiments done by men of genius, but to all the products of science and what makes them reliable. So we need to look to science in the earthly plane. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Nancy. This has been a fantastic presentation, very insightful. Uh, I, uh, I see our panelists uh, clapping and I can imagine that our numerous attendees uh, also enjoyed it. So I see already a few questions in the Q&A, but our plan for now is to have a couple of minutes uh, break and then we start again with uh, um, discussion with our uh, panelists. So I will uh, pause the recording for a few minutes and uh, we can uh, reconvene, uh, let's say at 29, past to be very precise with the schedule that said five minutes break. I see you in five minutes. Thank you. Recording. Welcome back uh, everyone to the second part of uh, the webinar with uh, Nancy Cartwright. Uh, Nancy just uh, gave us uh, um, a very thorough uh, explanation for why science should be uh, well uh, within uh, the earthly plane and why we should look at uh, reliability as uh, a core concept. Uh, I would now like to give uh, the floor uh, to our uh, panelists one by one. They uh, were very diligent in uh, preparing for uh, uh, questions for Nancy. So let me change the, the view. And I would like uh, to ask uh, Sonia, please, would you like to ask you the first question? Okay, so first of all, let me say that I enjoyed the presentation a lot. Um, now I have a question that relates to social epistemology. 
So the current findings and so it relates to what? Social epistemology. Social epistemology. Sorry. Okay. Um, my speaker is, I can't fix it. My speaker's on the floor. So oh, oh, but then <laughs> the, we waited. That's why that if you look, I'm leaning down. Sorry, go ahead. Ah, okay. So the idea of the virtuous um, tangle that you present, the virtuous tangle of science, stresses that the body of work under consideration should be rich. So there are many products uh, that should be available, many pieces, and they have to be connected in the right way, if I understood this well. Yeah. So then I assume that having more different pieces and maybe preferably having them instantly available on the shelf for the scientists to take them out should be a thing, a good thing, something that we should be aiming for. I'm sorry, they should be what? It should be a good thing, having all these products of science available on the shelf and preferably having them now so that I as a scientist can go and take them off the shelf and, and construct my new theory model, make science proceed. But then social epistemology, particularly the theory of Kevin Zolman. So he studies um, the effect of connectivity on the ability of a scientific community where all the scientists share their private information, the ability of that community to track the truth. And so he says that um, in some contexts, the community of scientists as a whole uh, is more reliable when the members are less aware of their colleagues' experimental findings. So you, and the idea is indeed that when you are too fast to take into account rival theories or wrong findings of others, they are not yet fully validated, we don't know yet, then that is not a good thing. It might not be beneficial for the progress of science. So you need to isolate, that depends of course what the aim is, but you may need to isolate the correct alternatives and block those so that the group can track the truth. So those are findings about communication in science. They come from social epistemology. So, but that seems to indicate to me that we have to regulate when these products become available or how many rival theories you can take into account. So that- How many what? How many rival theories or which products are actually good and which are not. Not anything goes. So that's my question to you about. Is that, is that a question? I thought that was an, I thought that was a, a nice account of uh, a social process uh, and and that how science is indeed um, a, a, a social process that depends on uh, things. Of course, um, you always have a trade-off between. Uh, I probably don't have anything very deep to say about this. You always have a trade-off between um, the time and effort it takes to search <laughs> um, and um, how much benefit that's going to give you and um, how likely it is you find something better, um, whether is it okay to satisfy in this case or not. Um, I need a measure. I need a poverty measure. Is this poverty measure um, that... Um, Tony Atkinson designed um, a, a good enough poverty measure for the job we have. Well, you know, I'm, I, maybe there's something better somewhere. Um, shall I? Yeah, I mean, is that, is that the kind of problem you were interested in? Because, I mean, I think those are real problems. Um, uh, and that's one of the things that I'd like to see us spending more, more time on. But I think it helps when we're thinking about spending time on that problem is to realize that um, there's, um, you're making these bets every, you know, at every stage, there's a zillion of these bets that's being made. Uh, I mean, you really, you're assuming that when you use Tony Atkinson's poverty measure, there's just lots, lots more that he assumed, right, in putting into the measure, et cetera, et cetera. Um, uh, and, um, I don't I, how how to get that um, uh, how to get people how to how to construct sorry how to make the institutional structure 
work right. so that that works. It seems to me it's a really important both philosophical and empirical, uh, sociological, political science question. It, it was right. So it's about the regulation of when the products become available and which you should or should not take into account for science to proceed. And I didn't see that the timing of when products become available as a part of this tangle that you propose. But I mean, but those are just, and those are questions that we need to think about, but they're standard questions in life. I mean, they're, they're, uh, <laughs> it seems to me those are questions you have each time you make a, a, a decision. Well, you know, did I look at all the alternatives? Uh, can I, I'm actually just uh, relying on a lot of habits and doing what my neighbor, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, it, it, uh, th that they might need special kind of consideration in the context of science, I agree with, and that you might want to have certain institutional structures that would make that process work better uh, but it, it does often work very well. And, you know, we do actually build lasers <laughs> and, uh, and I get my eye operated on them all the time. You know, you get your eyes operated and, you know, they are really reliable for, you know, cool, a cool beam uh, coming out the end of the laser. Uh, but, you know, the amount of background stuff that had to be in place in order to ensure the reliability of that, um, but all I meant to say is it does, it's, it's, it seems we've figured out some ways to, to have the, the, the social structure work, but we ought to study that more. Huh? Yeah. Okay, thank you. So while uh, John, uh, yeah, John prepares and unmutes uh, himself, uh, let me remind you that I will monitor questions from the audience in the Q&A chat. So I see one uh, hand raised. Can you please post your question there so that uh, we will be ready for the uh, later Q&A moment with the audience. So John, please. Yes. Thank you very much, Nancy, for a really lively talk on an extremely important uh, topic contemporarily. Uh, my question, too, is about uh, uh, scientific progress. Uh, you're focusing, for good reasons, on reliability. And also in your book, you're arguing in Chapter 4 that actually, uh, in the received view of science, the tangle is indeed may actually be seen as... Uh, establishing uh, reliability may actually be seen as accounting for the tangle. Yeah? So in that sense, that's very clear. But in the received view of science also, uh, establishing and increasing reliability drives theory development. Theory development normally yeah, is driven by establishing reliability. And in terms of the tangle, you might say that caps are just missing links, elaborate elements, and so on. So if that is all true, then maybe you could say a little bit more about how your notion of the tangle would help us in the received view of, of science uh, be smarter in theory development. <laughs> That's one question. Yeah. As a second question is that um, you are arguing on basis Hold on, let, let me just drop that one down. Okie doke. <laughs> how, does, how does the tangle help us be cl more clever about theory development, right? Yep. Okay. Could it yeah, provide some you. direction here? Okay. Okay. John? Yeah. Yeah, you can, you can, ah, no, Nancy, I think you can go ahead answering this first. Oh, I'm sorry, something. do them in, uh, okay. Um, I don't know that the um, idea of a tangle is particularly helpful for theory development. Uh, maybe it is. Uh, it's not the topic that we addressed. Uh, we got interested in um, really, I mean, it started out quite naturally with the conventional worries about um, confirmation, but I mean, I was actually worried about measures um, because that's one of the things I've done recently um, and noticing uh, the kind of problems we have and, and thinking about measures and that we wanted them to be reliable and that after all, if the measures weren't reliable, then all this other stuff fell apart. I was also, you know, taken up with the, um, I'm 
back at Stanford, um, I was a participant observer on the gravity probe experiment. And um, what I was impressed by was how to test the general theory of relativity, you had all this magnificent other stuff that had to be done, you know, like, you know, figuring out um, how to get a, a, a sphere that was perfectly homogeneous, right? And that had to be reliable that it was homogeneous, and the, et cetera, et cetera. The, the lapping method for making it homogeneous had to be reliable. So I got, it, it was all about getting something to work. Um, now, whether or not that, the, the, the things we need to get things in science to work are also a good clue to how to get the next product, whether that product's a theory or a better measure, I don't know. I mean, I, I'm sorry, it's a nice question and I don't have an answer to it. Uh, yeah. It really, <laughs> I mean, I, it was hard work for us to figure, realize that what we wanted, that, that there is this issue of reliability, uh, you know, getting it to work. Uh, and that's only part of what, you know, what science does. I agree with you. I mean, science also moves forward um, and it, it gets new things. But one of the ways you get new things is by, um, and getting them to be reliable, like the laser, right, is by, and the gravity probe is by calling on all these other products. And then sometimes you actually have to create a new product uh, to fill a gap that you, there wasn't one for. So not, not much... Not much to say about theory, theory development, as you might expect, since I don't really like theory. Okay. okay. Thank you. Uh, my, my other question is actually, you, you um, for, on basis of your, your acknowledgement of the importance of the tangle, you reject this notion of heroism in science, eh? because- I'm rejecting the notion of what? Heroism. Heroism, the man of genius. Oh, <laughs> hero! Oh, I see. Heroism, yes. yes. We could just yeah? pronounce it differently. Yeah. Sorry. Okay. Hero. Yeah. Okay. Her I, so, I say heroism, but that's okay. I mean, I just okay, no. I just couldn't hear it. Go ahead. Yeah. But you could could you not argue that actually we should not reject that notion, but adopt a less masculine version of it because. Establishing reliability, acknowledging the tangle is a much more dizzying task than establishing reliability in this classic sense of the word. So are we not actually looking in science for more heroes of a different type, the type that can fully acknowledge the tangle and uh, contribute to major steps in science by at critical moments analyzing the tangle and identifying where the right routes for progress are? <laughs> Maybe so. Uh, uh, um, um, it's not clear to me. I mean, I tend, I think, to think of it um, as a, a more social enterprise. You know, so um, there's a lot of different studies and um, I'm impressed by the studies that point out how much of a social enterprise and social epistemology kind of work that Sonia mentioned, that yeah. how much of a social enterprise it is, and that um, the feeling that um, you know, this hugely debatable issue, well, if X didn't have that brilliant idea, would somebody else have had something, maybe not that brilliant idea, but another brilliant idea that uh, would maybe have solved a different problem or solved this problem in a different way um, that, uh, I mean, it's, you're, I always feel it's lucky if you're in a position where you get the idea, right? Yeah. And, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. But in, in that sort of studies, the, the role of brokers, connectors, and so on, is emphasized a lot as quintessential eh, for bringing about indeed scientific progress. You might say, that is a very different sort of heroes, but these still are heroes. They oversee a lot of science and make it move. Yeah. Okay. But indeed, it's the core of a social process, but still. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So I will use my uh, uh, female powers uh, like a hero now <laughs> to move on to our next uh, panelist. So, Marcia, would you like to ask your question? Thank you, uh, Frederica. And uh, thank you so much, uh, Nancy, for your uh, very nice presentation. 
Um, my question will be not so much from the philosophical point of view, but a bit more from practice, um, because over the last one and a half year, I've been uh, quite heavily involved in giving policy advice, both medical, medical ethical advice for policy regarding the COVID pandemic and the management of that. Uh, so I've been increasingly confronted with issues regarding the reliability of, for example, the first RCT of a vaccine in children. Is that reliable enough to base a vaccine policy on? Questions mm -hmm. like that. Uh, and I think you can see actually the tangle at work in those uh, questions and deliberations that we have. Uh, but I've also been confronted with issues regarding the explainability of science to a larger audience and also the erosion of trust of the public at large in science and the products of science. So be it behavioral advice or uh, vaccines or COVID tests, there's even part of the public that doesn't really uh, believe that the whole COVID virus exists at all. Um, so, well, I think some critics have blamed uh, stuff like postmodernism for relativizing the notion of truth and saying that it's all relative and stuff like that. Well, however that be, uh, I was and, wondering... And, and we actually believe that those philosophical positions had such power and grip on the public imagination that so, <laughs> we were responsible for this dreadful thing. I, I, I completely agree. So regardless of whether that whole idea is correct, uh, that philosophy is to blame for this, I, I was wondering how you think that your vision in which you put reliability much more to the forefront rather than truth, uh, and, and you know, use this idea of a tangle, um, how you think that would be explainable to a larger public and whether that will well, w will it increase trust, maybe, if you can explain how it works, or will it rather decrease trust because the notion of truth is, more, well, more in the background, so uh -huh. um, Oh, goodness. Um, well, we started out, uh, <laughs> I'm sorry, I keep telling you about the history of the book, but we started out um, with the question, um, it was going to be called Why Trust Science? Uh, but then it turned out that we were, I mean, to use an old distinction that I'm not allowed to make you know, between internal and external, uh, 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 it, we were only looking at the internal reasons. I mean, somehow, what are the procedures in science? What's going on in science that makes uh, its products trustworthy? Uh, and um, it might be um, that, well, I don't really, I, I don't think I have a, a, a good thought on it. It's, it, it's just on that, um, the, it's, it, it, it's, it is on about what people will take to be reliable from science and not take to be. So there's a, that kind of standard story about people who won't get vaccinated, but they'll have cataract operations with a laser. Or you know, um, or or various kind of other tests. So um, I, I'm not sure. I'm not sure how a refocus from truth to reliability um, would affect. Um, I mean, because I don't really know how much um, is you know public is affected by things I worry about, like, I don't actually think these scientific claims are true, or I think, you know, I, don't, I think some of them are true and some of them aren't, but some of the ones we find most useful are probably not true, or, you know, next generation, they won't think it's true. Um, I, I, I don't think that the kind of Kuhnian uh, scientific revolution <laughs> worries are what's driving people uh, to not trust science. So I, um, I'm noticing that we should be focusing on those to begin with um, is probably not not much of a help. So, sorry. <laughs> okay, thank you, Marcia. I would like to give the floor to Case now. Uh, thanks, Federica. Uh, Nancy, thank you very much for a nice presentation uh, and also for sharing the early version of the manuscript of the book with us. Uh, I went uh, over the manuscript and um, when I was reading, uh, I was wondering, Sis, yeah. could you, could you, could you uh, just for a moment, try to be really still and really close to your mic? Because some, uh, Marcia, I could hear perfectly. Uh, yeah. 
Can you can you understand me clearly now? Yes, thank you. Okay. Um, when going over the book, I was uh, thinking, well, how can I get my head around this tangle? And uh, I was thinking about the different levels of uh, uh, analytics that is used in uh, data science and business analytics, for example. There you have the lowest level, descriptive uh, analytics, and then you have diagnostic analytics, and then predictive analytics, etc. And in the end, prescriptive. So I was thinking, where does the tangle uh, begin and where does it end? And you could also, uh, instead of looking at the tangle at a bit lower level, for example, only descriptive level, thinking going the other direction to a higher complexity level. For example, uh, in economics, we always want in the end our methodology to be applied in, in policy. And, um, you know, is this tangle um, maybe larger than just science? And um, is it then uh, reliable in the sense that uh, it can help uh, guide us through transitions like the energy transition? Yes. Um, so I think um, the, um, you might have noticed that um, I, um, that the, um, I sometimes think of the tangle um, um, rather than a tangle, um, that science is like a huge Meccano set and you've got lots of different pieces and that you can put them together um, to do, to build different things. Um, now, if you, um, if you really want to, I mean, so how much is required in order to assure the reliability of this laser or this kind of laser um, or you know, one of your examples. Um, well, very often what happens, uh, I think, is that um, we, um, science, is, science works by, in a sense, overbuilding. So that um, even if this particular measure isn't quite measuring it, measuring something we needed, um, the homogeneity of those fused uh, quartz spheres in that experiment that I've talked about. Uh, even if this measure isn't entirely accurate, we actually measured it six different ways. We have six different measures available. And because this was a really critical thing, you know, that there was a lot of effort put into assuring the reliability of the, this object to be um, totally homogeneous. Um, so, um, how much is enough and where does it stop? Well, you know, I don't think it ever actually stops. I mean, you keep going uh, on and, and in, into what other areas does it stretch? But um, you can usually, right, uh, there, you tack it the other way. There's just a lot of stuff you rely on all the time. And what you look for is the stuff that you have a reason to think is gonna be dicey. Hmm. Uh, and um, so it's not as if there is a tangle that supports, you know, there's a definitive, well laid out tangle that supports that, uh, that, that this fused quartz sphere is going to do the job you want it to, but rather that um, you're worried about um, all the things that might, that might go wrong. And of course, sometimes we don't know that. And so our products don't turn out to be reliable. And then we say, oh my goodness, you know, maybe we should have thought of, um, the uh, the landslide that's going to you know create a huge wave. Uh, actually, looking back on it, we actually should have thought about that more seriously in the first place. Anyway, sorry. So that that's not a very interesting. Uh, I, I don't have any interesting answers to these questions. Well, well is, is it is it is it always uh, uh, science, or can it also be larger than science? That that is yeah maybe the core of the question. And so do you sometimes need more than just science, also politics, uh, citizens' involvement, etc.? Yeah. Okay. okay, good. Thanks. So I think we can move on to uh, Hank. I, and I'm hoping that some of the panelists who have looked at these things and thought about them are going to help answer the questions. They can you send you more questions. You've got a different, you have a different angle on it than I do and a, and a fresh look at it. Nancy, I can assure you that uh, we won't be able to, uh, to ask all the questions so we can compile them and send them to you in case they are helpful uh, in the revision of the book. <laughs> okay, so uh, Hank, please. 
Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, first of all, can you hear me uh, clearly, Nancy? Yes, if you don't jiggle around. I'm, I'm okay. really sorry. Okay, no problem. But, I try to... Uh, we've tried to have... That. They actually brought me a new computer, a new monitor, and it's... <laughs> sorry. I'll try to sit still and speak loudly, clearly. Um, so first of all, thanks, uh, thanks for your talk. And, and the first thing I should say is that uh, I, I sympathize with your account uh, and, and also with the general idea behind it, behind the tangle, which of course was a, a new way of, of phrasing it. But, but I, 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 think it, I think it meshes quite well with your work, doesn't it? I think so. I mean, I'm not trying to get you on board with what, I what we're <laughs> claiming, but still I thought no. that, that there was a lot of um, complementarities there. That, yeah, exactly. So I also had a bit of a hard time coming up with really critical questions. So I have some questions which are perhaps more questions for clarification. I I think indeed, well, so what I see it as a, well, first of all, as a, as a shift from uh, to, to from universalism to contextualism, you, you don't use the, the notion of context, I think, in your talk, but I think that's, that can be uh, added to it, or uh, it would be a, a way to talk about it, and and also, of course, the focus on these uh, neglected uh, products of science, as you call them. So, uh, my first question um, is about reliability, the issue of reliability, and then especially uh, about this uh, case of the Veyond Dam. I didn't know how to pronounce it, but that's how you pronounce it. But it's in Italy, right? So I don't know how it's Federico, pronounced. Federico, how do we pronounce it? Yeah, Federica. Veyond. Veyond. Veyond, that's right. Sorry, Veyond. that's how that's how Leonor pronounces it. Okay. But in, in English, it's Veyond. Veyond, yeah. <laughs> but we, we don't have to speak English because, you, you know, we're, we're Europeans. <laughs> Let's try uh, the Italian then, Bayon Dam. Anyway, um, so uh, uh, I, I, well, I agree with your, with your uh, uh, point that this case uh, shows that, uh, that it's reliability rather than truth that matters. And that reliability indeed is always reliability for a particular purpose. Eh? And, and this, I think, me, uh, implies that the context is essential. Eh? So yes, yes. The context it's reliability in a particular context for a particular person. And in this particular context, um, as I understand it, uh, so a, a very important purpose uh, or, or value was, well, not totally neglected, but at least undervalued, namely the safety of human lives. Uh, and, and this also reminded me, uh, it, it might be analyzed in terms of, of uh, inductive risk. Uh, so uh, yes. Heather Douglas's uh, account of inductive yes. risk and the value judgments that are well, essential there are. And I think in your book, you, you mentioned this in a footnote somewhere. So, so this is a way to talk about that, yes. right? Yes. Okay. Um, but now you also suggest uh, or uh, in this, in this uh, that, that the engineers here uh, should not have relied on the generic claims, uh, especially with respect to limestone here, uh, and, and that they should have taken what you call in your book, I think, local knowledge into account. And so they should have... Uh, and and this is yeah, interesting. So in, the, in the book we talked about local knowledge and uh today i mentioned um more structural stuff that they could have done that um that they didn't do i mean that you know there are all sorts of studies you can do of you know, go look at the limestone and do yeah. structural tests on it and things like that and they didn't do much of that yeah okay so so they at least the generic claims weren't enough and they should have done more uh, looked more closely into it uh, maybe taking the local knowledge into account or, or this structural stuff. And so that made me think, I think that's right. That's or, Well, that's true, I should say, or maybe it's not about truth, but it's I correct. agree. <laughs> <laughs> it's correct, right. Um, but so my then my question, uh, I, I thought, okay, uh, what? so what does this also imply or mean that reliability is just um, maybe... Uh, one among is also a value, and and maybe one value that that may that can be traded off against other values, uh, uh -huh. and that it depends on the context, uh, uh, which whether you want to have really reliable dams, for instance, or maybe a bit less reliable, or is your because you, I, I guess you will say no because reliability is the essence, and so is reliability perhaps the essence of science or the purpose. Uh, the, the, the main thing that we we, uh, we are searching for or uh, we want to achieve is reliability itself contextual. Uh, so 
can it be articulated in different ways uh, depending on the context and so in that case would it mean that for instance maybe in in, in another context or uh, even with this dam in another context that um that there are is an alternative context where you uh, would have a more reliable result by neglecting local knowledge or by neglecting um, these these structural uh, constraints or uh, uh, well this, this yes. uh, is, so well I hope I I've made myself clear that that's my uh, my question okay um, and and an example perhaps if if you say uh, yes. Uh, yeah, I would have to think of an example, but there ought to be cases where, um, I mean, th uh, this was, um, is, are these plans, these models and plans reliable um, enough to do the job that is required, you know, where you take, sweep into the idea of what the job is, a lot of what the purposes are. And um, judging that it's reliable enough will depend a lot on um, how important those purposes are, right? So, you know, how much do we want to invest in either making it more reliable or being sure that it's as reliable as we think it is? Um, and that is, again, more like the issue of inductive risk. I mean, how much, how much depends on this being reliable to the degree that you think it is for these purposes? So, um, and because the purposes are implicitly here meant, um, you know, not threatening lives, um, we would have uh, very high standards. And they did have very high standards um, in, in that, I mean, they really worked hard to get a dam that would stand, right? It wouldn't just crumble and, and flood the valley. Mm -hmm. uh, so um, I think that um, uh, it's not that I wasn't going to, I wasn't thinking of, Yes, I think you can trade reliability for other things, but um, I want to make sure that you already have figured out what you know what you want it to be reliable for. So we didn't just want the product to be the models to be reliable for building a dam that stands. We wanted them to be reliable for a dam that stands and doesn't threaten lives in any way. Uh, or yeah, okay, and um, you could. Uh, trade that reliability off against something else and, uh, that um, uh, you it's might important. want something. I mean, in this case, you know, the lives really matter. So maybe we need a less um, a less contentious case. But there are a lot of times when you trade reliability for quickness. I mean, I, yeah. well, you know, we could get a more reliable product, but we really got to get it out there right away, um, either right. because it's politically necessary, or, you know, people want to see something happen, or the, the 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 cost of it being unreliable isn't as big as the cost of not doing anything. Yeah, okay. So are you going to say something else? No, exactly. I mean, this is just what I was interested in. So, for instance, if you say, well, it has to be cheap or it has to be fast, like uh, pragmatic or economic values, or uh, that can that or can something be reliable? Uh, can can you say, okay, in another context, the dam would have been. Uh, reliable because it's cheap and uh, there were because we built it in a cheap way and and this um, fosters our economic aims or goals uh, uh, well I don't know I would just expect it to do I mean like uh, the, the sense I was having of reliable is it can do a job that we set it yeah. uh, and then it can do a job that we set it and cost the earth and it can do a job that we set it <laughs> and be cheap and it can do a job that we set it and be you know and have only a certain probability of doing that job uh and so forth but i think that you could you know that your um how much more you want that it can do the job and then even doing the job right might yeah. not be the most important thing here um uh because it might be that in order to get something that does the we talk about this in um policy all the time um it might be that um you really uh, this is a popperian idea a popper idea that um you uh, might find that having a reliable social pro program a program that you have reason to think is reliable to solve yeah. a certain social problem or to address a certain social problem um is just gonna cost too much 
and we'll just go work on another, you know, for that amount of money, we could work on three other social problems. So there we're trading off, um, you know, uh, uh, it's not that we're taking something that's unreliable for this problem. You know, we're just, we, we're, we're realigning our priorities because of, you know, not being able to find something that is likely to be reliable for the job, given how much money we want to spend or, or how much human effort we want to um, uh, put it in or, you know, or given the fact that everything that's reliable for doing this job will also do something else which is pretty bad, right? I mean, it could be reliable for doing this job. And then, <laughs> I don't know, you know, you could either say it's reliable for doing this job, but it also does really bad stuff. Or you could say, actually, in this context, the purposes in, impl implicit are in, involved that should do the job and not do a lot of bad stuff as well, right? I mean, you, so you can shift back and forth between, um, what, yeah, the way yeah. you look at it, but and it's yeah. as you oh, the other thing you asked about was context, and context is really really important, and it's one of the reasons I want to focus on taking things off the shelf, because yeah. um, whether this is an appropriate um, object that the product to take off the shelf depends not just on the job that needs to be done, but the context in which that job is being done, and it's mm -hmm. the context that helps set all these this long. It's sort of implicit list of purposes. Yeah, you know, we don't want the job done that way. <laughs> uh, yeah. Okay. Well, yeah. So yeah. thank you so much, Hank, yeah. and thanks uh, to the uh, uh, all the panelists uh, for the very rich discussion so far. Yeah. So thank for, you. For you to know, Nancy, there was also a second round of questions already prepared, and if you don't mind, I will uh, send you the questions after uh, the event uh, later today. So. With this, we can now move on uh, to um, the uh, time uh, for questions from the audience. We have already 15 questions lined uh, up, but I also see that some people had uh, uh, to leave the meeting, so I'm not sure who is still around and who is not. So I will uh, take the liberty of giving voice to whoever has asked the question, and uh, so Nancy, that you can answer as many of them. And again, if you don't mind, I will send you the, the questions that have not been answered after the uh, the webinar is that okay with you thank you sure thank you okay so the first question that just so long as you don't think i'm going to write back answers to them all uh because most of them i won't have answers to and i have this beastly report due no surely not but uh, maybe some of them will be useful to you yeah, they'll be you, very very useful if, if you I get a chance to... apology that when i get them <laughs> no i don't sit down and say thank you to everybody Thank you to everybody in advance, and I'll read them and think about them, but I doubt if I'm going to be... <laughs> yeah, but uh, at least you will have a chance to see all the questions that have been uh, posted. Yeah, thank in you the, very the much. Internet. That'll be super. With, I'll do it with pleasure. So the first question that was uh, posted is uh, uh, by Lute Ledesdorf. He says, it seems to me that the specification of uncertainty, for example... Oh, let's read more slowly, Federica. Yeah. You're... Yes, I'll try. It seems to me that the specification of uncertainty, for example, error bars, are crucial as indicators of reliability. This would reflexively hold, also hold about your statements. Uh -huh. so that they, yeah. What would you say, Nancy? That you also have some kind of error bars for the type of reliability uh, you're trying to... Uh, you, you, mean, you mean the philosophical claims I make have um, error bars around them? Sure. Uh, that's why one reason why you give talks to other people uh, so they will correct the errors or take the ideas and um, maybe say they're not worth pursuing or pursue them in different ways. Um, it's because they have, uh, uh, it's, it's a cumulative, uh, it's a community exercise doing philosophy uh, because there's always error bars in all activities and um, uh, yeah. Okay, thank you, Nancy. So the second question came from Hernan Bovadilla and this brings us to some continental philosophy actually. He says, is the tangle of science conceptually distinct from Deleuze and Guattari's concept of rhizome? If so, in which ways? So, I don't know. <laughs> uh, I don't know. Uh, if, um, 
uh, I don't know. Okay, Fernanda, you will I have to contact Nancy directly. I didn't recognize that there were, I mean, it wouldn't be a surprise if there was a totally different way of starting out thinking that ended up with ideas that were very similar. I just didn't, I uh, don't know. Um, but it's a, thank you for the question because um, the, um, I can get my science study students. I'm going to UCSD if all goes well in January. And I think the science study students um, are likely to be able to help with that. Good, thanks. So further question came from uh, Paulo Camacho. So we, I'm going to read uh, what to do in situations where the concept of reliability itself is defined differently within the tangle, i.e. in cases where within a particular science, say molecular biology, reliability is defined in various ways depending on the practitioners, the method or other. I think I don't understand the question that reliability is defined differently. I think it's established in, I mean, as maybe, I'm probably just not getting, getting, the, getting the idea. Um, reliability is established different way, in, in different ways for different kind of products and different kinds of claims. And um, different disciplines have immediately to hand, you know, different products that they call on, you know, different methods and uh, different concepts they use. Uh, I don't think, I mean, uh, reliability I just has a reliability just has a very loose definition. It says um, that this this thing will do the job you want it to do for the purposes you want it to do in this context. So um, it, it's a very, uh, you know, it's a highly relational thing. It's reliable to do X for Y. And um, as Hank said, I didn't pay enough attention to, to stating in, in this context, right? It will do yeah. it, but I, mean, I swept the context into the purposes. Yeah, I was going to say that the purpose is going to play a big role in this narrative that you set up. Okay, so the next question comes from Cesar Garcia Diaz. Uh, he says, I wonder to what extent these products of science are rather products of engineering. Reliability is a central concept in engineering since engineered products must demonstrate functionality. The example about recidivism, propensity, algorithm conflates engineering and social science into one thing. Uh, I think, um, uh, I think this, let's say, who was it, the person who said it? Uh, Cesar Garcia Diaz. That's caught on to. Um, uh, a basic I, uh, attitude I have is that uh, science, there's not a distinction between science and engineering uh, for the most part, that um, science um, creates products that should be, that we want to be reliable. Um, sometimes uh, they're high theory and there are reasons you want high theory. Now not, I mean, you might want high theory and you don't want to be reliable for anything even to tell the truth about the world, mm -hmm. that, um, that you use it for other purposes or um, that it sat satisfies curiosity or something. But you know, most of the things, uh, even theory, you want them to be reliable uh, to, to do something. And um, that's an engineering concept. Uh, yeah. and, um, and you use pieces, <laughs> I mean, it was the, this is back now away from the Jacana bird uh, picture to the Makano picture. Um, you, uh, in order to engineer uh, a new dam, right, you use a, a ton of pieces that have been engineered by somebody else, right? Yeah. Um, and they were engineered, the way those were engineered was engineered by somebody else. They're all, I think they're all things that are made by science and then used by science. So I, the, um, I think the idea that it's just engineering all the way down uh, <laughs> and um, even, and I think that I, I actually think that, you know, my, many of you will know that I have um, always had worries about high theory and high theory telling the truth. Um, I think it does wonderful things for us, but I, think I could never figure out a way to make it um, be 
even plausibly true and yet be able to do all the jobs we want it to do. Yep. Um, so then I began to focus on the jobs we want it to do. And then I thought, well, yeah, yes, um, I don't know. You, the rest of you can worry about whether about it being true. Uh, uh, I can't figure out how to formulate it so that it could be true and still do the jobs we want. I'm going to focus on trying to understand more about the jobs we want it to do and um, evaluating its likelihood of being able to do those jobs. So, yeah. yeah, thanks. So next question comes uh, from uh, Josef or Joseph Bellina. It seems to me that what you have described is what we what what is needed to solve any challenge we face. If so, what makes science distinct from any other human endeavor? Uh, not a clue. Uh, <laughs> uh, the uh, demarcation problem uh, is uh, is I. Uh, don't have um, much much of a view of. Um, I do want. Um, uh, I do want my decisions about my children to be reliable to do the job that I wanted that decision to do. Um, uh, I think I can use the notion of reliability there, or the way I'm. You know, I don't know, um, uh, the decision we made about hiring somebody. Um, but um, I don't think that um, the any um, um, so maybe uh, this, that in that way there's uh, no difference. Um, but it might be that the um, tools available are um, a lot different for. The thinking about the decisions about my children than they are thinking about decisions about getting this perfectly homogeneous uh, sphere uh, to use in the gravity probe experiment. Yep. So I think the tools available are very different um, and there's a histor history and sociology of them, uh, but that's a very interesting answer. But then um, I haven't seen any other very interesting answers either. <laughs> Okay, thanks. So, so we then started out, sorry, it yeah. might be worth thinking about. Um, again, as I said, we started uh, thinking about, you know, why, why trust science, but not why was science trustworthy. And um, my younger daughter um, uh, has a PhD in um, theology, fourth century church fathers and patristics. And patristics is a very, very, very demanding, critical, uh, study and it, 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 it combines empirical knowledge. How long does it take to walk from Athens to somewhere else? So could someone have met someone so they could have been influenced by that idea, etc. Along with you know a critical interlinking of um, and having to account for the evidence. A lot of the evidence is textual, right? but you know you have to be consistent with these texts and so forth. Um, and I think it's a really interesting question. Is I mean, do we think that that's importantly different from science? I mean, it certainly has feed in from empirical things. So maybe it doesn't make many empirical predictions. It does also make predictions about what you might find in an, in an undiscovered text, that, which she did. So um, since this question is about what, you know, how that differs from most everything else in life, I also just don't even know how to, um, uh, how to, you know, I would raise some issues about reliability in patristics as well. Um, and I don't know what distinguishes it from science, but I think we all really don't want to call it science. And I don't know what difference it makes that we don't want to call it science either. I mean, I think a lot of that, sorry, I think a lot of that issue would depend on what hangs on it. Right? I mean, are we going to teach students patristics rather than biology? No. <laughs> right? uh, but are we going to teach students patristics? Are we going to teach them that? what these patristics people teach is true, but then I don't want you teaching them that what the biologist says is true either. So, um, I'm sorry. Yeah, okay, thanks. Then uh, we have uh, questions from Sarah Steiger, and there are two relatively simple questions. The first one, the list of scientific products was long and surely not meant to be taken as exhaustive. Thus, my first question, would you say that scientific knowledge is also a product of science. Why yes or no? Scientific knowledge? 
Yeah, as a yes. product. Um, okay. Knowledge claims are product of science. Yeah. Okay. And then the second question is to play a nice version of the advocate's devil, the use of product and shelves to put the products on and to retake them from to take them from seems to be borrowed from a capitalistic perspective. We are all in the scientific supermarket. Would you say that the market analogy is suitable for science? Uh, I don't think it has to be a capitalist market in order to have um, uh, uh, want quality assured assurance of products and um, getting the products to, to be able to do the jobs you want. That was uh, part of um, the, I mean, for instance, you know, Otto Neu was head of the Commission for Full Social Planning and uh, she's very short lived Bavarian social, uh, so, so, so socialist republic uh, at the end of the First World War. And they were hugely influenced by the idea that you, know, you, could, um, you could actually have reliable plans for, uh, you know, you could figure out where the, you know, how much mining, how, how much ore you could get from here, how you could get the core coal, uh, where would be the best place to put it, um, and that was all, um, uh, and, and but, but the, one of the important points was they were very concerned about, he was, but yeah, quality assurance of the, uh, the products. You had to know how good this coal was right? and how good this ore was and how good it was going to be for what you wanted to do with it to make steel out of it, say. Right? Um, so I don't see that uh, the idea of talking about quality assurance and having information of having stuff available that's already been tested, uh, or uh, you know, uh, what's, what was the word I used? I didn't use the word test, I very carefully chose the right word, um, yeah. but it's been accredited. Yeah. that's already been accredited um, is, um, I, I, I think that's a good socialist idea. Okay. Now we have another question about the taking off the shelf from Jeff Crouch. So for the taking off the shell mode, in general, quality in general quality assurance terms, this mode looks to be regression testing. One task- So it looks to be what? Um, Regression testing. Regression testing. Let me go through the uh, the answer and then we see whether we. Yeah. Uh, so, but start the question again. So we're yeah. going to have we're thinking about taking things off the shelf. Yeah. In general, quality assurance terms, this mode looks to be regression testing. One task quality assurance proves out with regression testing is the support matrix which means that the interface between the product under test and the supported products interfaced with are proved out or not by a regression testing. Is this interpretation in line with your concept? I don't know whether we know enough of assurance, uh, uh, quality assurance, but Nancy, I let you answer. I think I don't know. Um, uh, regression testing is, uh, What's can we get to tell us what regression testing is? Okay, so maybe I suggest that I go through some more questions and then uh, uh, if we still have time and Jeff is still with us, then uh, they can qualify their answer and uh, explain a bit better because I wouldn't know either, but okay. Okay, uh, so, well, my, yeah, good. Uh, then we get a question from uh, Marie Mananili and the question is, when you suggest to take the products of science off the shelf, does it relate to the open gaps between science and the complexities of the real world? Uh, it certainly does. Uh, because um, uh, the, um, let's put it this way, the, oh, many products are only reliable um, in certain very closed contexts, right? Um, that you have to be, um, uh, you have to be in a whatchamacallit box that excludes um, uh, other magnetic things in order for your MRI to work properly, right? So some, um, some products are reliable for certain purposes, um, but only subject to, you know, uh, certain uh, huge constraints and others um, are 
built with a kind of casing around them so that you can take them out into the complex world because that <laughs> there, I mean, I think of like batteries, you know, that are battery casing around them. Uh, 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 and um, yep. lo 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 lots of, in order to assure reliability, you very often have to have, um, ensure that the product is working in what we might call a small world, right? Where, only, where most of the other causal influences that would mess up its reliability are excluded. So that means part of building the product is building a wall so that what's going on inside the world is not hugely uh, you know, messy and complex and has all sorts of odd um, uh, unpredictable uh, influences on it. You've actually built the product in such a way that it excludes those so that it will be reliable to do what you want uh, because you've, you know, you've, you've controlled the major variables that it takes to get it reliable. Yep. Okay, so uh, we are about halfway through the 15 questions that were posed and we have a few minutes left. So I suppose I suggest we take another couple of them and then we decide whether we should continue after the uh, Planned and time, or whether we should stop. So, question from I, I have a I I have another appointment at the end. So, in that case, I will uh, take probably just one question more from uh, the Q and A chat, and then we can close the the meeting, Nancy. Uh, so, the question is: uh, Would you suggest extending the idea of reliability to include reliability of theories with respect to empirical adequacy plus other virtues? so that the notion of truth is also removed from theories, experiments, and great men? If so, what terms would you prefer as replacements for true and false when expressing positive or negative sentiment towards a given theory? Okay, I think you could say, I want this theory um, to be reliable, um, in this, it, for the job of being empirically adequate across this range of phenomena, right? Um, that would suit me because, you know, then we're not talking about, um, we want it to be uh, true, uh, but we've got a certain job we want it to do. Um, and you could want it to do that job um, simply, right? In a simple way or et cetera. Um, so I, I mean, all that seems to me to be, um, in line with my uh, feeling that, um, you know, empirical adequacy is a pretty big thing. I mean, I don't actually think that we, you know, um, that theories um, are empirically adequate. Our best theories are empirically adequate. They, they don't even cover, you know, because I believe Lakatosh uh, in the sense that all the theories I know are born refuted. Um, so, um, but that, I mean, that's another reason for wanting theories to be um, reliable for you know, using in this context, uh, in this way, um, but maybe not for using in that context in that way. Um, yeah, okay. So many thanks to all attendees for staying with us until now and for posting all these uh, uh, fantastic questions. Many, many thanks to all the panelists yes. also for being very diligent and disciplined in preparing well, reading the material, preparing great questions, staying on time. Huge thanks to, to Nancy for accepting the invitation in the first place and for giving uh, a great uh, uh, talk full of insights. Uh, I would probably like to give the floor to Hub for a, a final uh, um, goodbye. Uh, and then uh, we close uh, this uh, webinar, which has been a fantastic occasion of get together, even though just online. So Nancy, you still owe us a visit uh, live in Amsterdam. Well, thank you very much, uh, Professor Kartbart. That was, that was beautiful. We learned a lot again. And at the uh, EAS of the University of Amsterdam, we're interested in all kinds of complex problems. This only reminds us that science itself is one of the biggest complex problems um, yeah. we have. So thanks for this and uh, uh, be sure we will uh, invite yeah, thanks, you for a decent dinner in the future. Yeah.